So I guess I should, I should preface this by saying I think most speakers here are probably uh, serious and have um, big important things to tell you. Make a living making fun of Silicon Valley so, uh, and making fun of startups so in various ways. Um, but I do have some uh, thoughts that might be of, of use to you as you're going off to start a company. Um, I recently published a book uh, based on my experience working in a startup as an old guy in a startup, which um, has just come out. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are in the book. Before I do, I wanted to tell you a story. And it's about this photo. That's me in the left with all dark hair. When I was a young guy in the late 80s, I was a reporter. and. Um, I worked for a trade magazine in Boston, and the woman on the right was my colleague, and we got sent out to do a story about Microsoft, which at the time was not the biggest software company in the world. It was, uh, there were other software companies that were actually bigger than Microsoft. They were important because they made DOS, and they were just starting to roll out Windows, but they weren't really what they became. There's a, another piece of trivia in this photo, is that the woman in the bottom left, the PR woman watching us, ended up uh, marrying Steve Ballmer, the CEO of, of uh, my, well, former CEO of Microsoft now. Anyway, the story is that my friend Pat, the woman and I, went out and we met Bill Gates, who looks very young in that picture, and we spent three days and we came back and we wrote a bunch of stories about Microsoft and the, what the, Microsoft was saying at the time is, I know you think we're just operating systems, but we're gonna, we're gonna do apps, we're gonna do a word processor and a spreadsheet and all this stuff. And at the time, that seemed insane that, that Microsoft would get into apps. And how could they ever beat Lotus? Lotus 1, 2, 3 is the spreadsheet and, and databases and word processors. It was word perfect at the time. Anyway, we came back and we wrote up these stories saying, this is Microsoft's next new thing. They're going to try to do this. And the twist is that Pat then turned right around and went back to Redmond and got a job at Microsoft. And 10 years later, she had retired. And 10 years later, I was still scraping away, making no money as a journalist. And it taught me a very important lesson, which is that you, know, you should go work in the tech industry rather than writing about it. Writing about it maybe wasn't the, the best way to, to make a living. Um, so you flash forward to 2012, and I was the technology editor at Newsweek in New York. And I got laid off because the media business was, was dying. It was, you know, magazines and newspapers are going out of business. And I looked around and I realized it wasn't just my publication that was dying. It was the whole industry I was in was dying. And um, I had to do something new. And I thought, now is the time to do the thing I should have done in 1988. I'm going to go work at a tech company. I'm going to go <clears throat> get a job in one of these places. And... I looked around and I realized there was this next dot-com bubble happening, that the first dot-com bubble had blown up and exploded and I had covered all of that as a, a business reporter at Forbes magazine. But now, you almost couldn't believe it, but there was another bubble taking place. And in most of the United States and most of the world, I think you, you weren't really aware of it, but I happened to be working in San Francisco at the time, walking around in South of Market where Uber and Twitter and all these companies are, and it was like, it was like Groundhog Day. It was like you're seeing the same movie start to take shape again. Like there's, you know, grown men on scooters riding around and the coffee costs seven dollars and, you know, there's all these kooky companies and it was like, holy shit, it's happening again. Like this wave is taking form again. So I said, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get in there. So I found a company, I happen to live in Boston, which is on the East Coast, and I didn't want to move to California. But I found a company in Cambridge called HubSpot. And I ended up spending two years working at this place, and that's what my, my new book is about. Um, and this, to me, was like the epitome of a startup. Like, I wanted to work at a young, growing, pre-IPO kind of company, but I didn't want to do the five-person company. That was too much risk for me, because I have uh, young kids. Um, and HubSpot was right in the, in the middle of that. And there's something, I think, that you probably are all aware of, but I had bought into this too, was this idea of uh, the entrepreneur being on a hero's journey. There's this mythology that's been built up around startups, especially in the last 10 years. And I think we all get fed this. And I don't know where this mythology originated, 
but it certainly gets propagated by VC firms and by blogs that are in part funded by VC firms. And it's this idea of the entrepreneur as the hero, you know, in the Joseph Campbell idea of the hero who's on this hero's journey. And he, he doesn't want that safe Fortune 500 job. He wants to control his destiny and he's going to slay dragons and disrupt markets and in the end he's going to overcome obstacles and he's going to triumph. And it's sold as this very romantic, exciting adventure. And I completely bought into that. And in part of that adventure too, you're going to make the world a better place. That's what we make fun of a lot on the show, on the HBO show. It's like, no matter what you're making, at the end of your slide deck you say, oh, and we want to make the world a better place, right? This has become this thing, you're, you're the heroes who are out there to save the world, right? And uh, the rhetoric gets a little bit lofty and ridiculous, which is why it lends itself to satire so well. Um, anyway, I'm going to show you a few slides of HubSpot, and you can imagine that I came from, my previous two companies were 80 years old, each of them. They were big, hierarchical, old media organizations with lots of perks in certain ways, but also very, very hard to change, you know, really resistant to change. So this place had this cool little bar area. There was a nap room where you could go in and have a nap. There was um, this room. I don't even know what this room is, but they had this room that was supposed to be like the relaxation room where it's essentially you're sitting in a closet, but they put you know, a mural that looks like the woods and it looks like a porch. And I love this girl's expression because even she doesn't know what the fuck she's doing there, right? She's just like, I don't know. I'm here having my picture taken in the relaxation room. I mean, they just had nothing to do with this space, so they just made a little porch out of it. Um, they had a big wall of candy. They were very proud of the candy wall. On my first day, I got a tour and they said, this is, this is the essence of our culture, the candy wall, because we're fun. We're all about fun. That's what this company is. We're fun. And I was like, fine, I get it. You're fun. This candy, right? Like, I'm 50 years old. I'm not eating any candy, right? Like, fine. And, uh, oh, and then on Halloween, it was like, it's our company thing. We all dress up. And I was like, I'm not dressing up. Like, I'm not wearing a costume. I'm not driving to work, you know, dressed as a vampire. I'm just not going to do it. Like, I'm, I'm 50, right? And, and then it was like, we dare to be different, right? Like, see, but... When you really think of it, just look at it a little closer and see how different do you think those people really are. It's basically a bunch of white people in the 20s, right? And they're like, it's, it's, there's no difference at all, right? It's, in fact, it's very uniform. Like, there's a very heavy amount of conformity, right? Um, dressed up as, we're so different. Nonetheless, to me, this was like, we're reinventing work, right? And with three Ps, I call it parties, perks, and purpose. So the parties and the perks are obvious. And it's like, you have fun. And then the purpose was, we went into training and they told us, you, this isn't just software. We're changing people's lives, okay? We are making a difference in the world. And you're very special to be here. And this is an important mission that you're on. And I'm just too old to buy into shit like that, right? I'm just like really old and I'm the wrong person for that kind of environment, right? But I did think, okay, I did believe this part of it, that startups are not just creating products. They're also reinventing how we work, like what work means, right? And it's not just things like flex time or working from home or having a workforce all over the world. It's sort of what does a company mean? What, how does it operate? So I, I thought I wanted to see that. I wanted to see what is work going to look like for the next 10, 20, 30 years. I've, I've been in the old world of work my entire career, like in big very hierarchical media organizations with a lot of management, a lot of structure. <clears throat> I wanted to see this new thing. And long story short, it didn't really go very well, but this is what I thought I was gonna be like working in a startup, and, and this is what I really was. Like I got there and it was like, I don't know if you've ever seen Office Space, but that, I became Milton, right? This is me, like my stapler. I was like, I was seriously just immediately pegged as like, you're the old guy, you don't get it, you're stupid, sit off in the corner, shut the fuck up, you don't get it. The people would ask me like, do you know how to use Facebook? I'd be like, yeah, I know how to use Facebook, you know? Have you, you know, are you on Twitter? I'm like, yeah, I, I've been on Twitter for a while, like I, I have a blog, you know? Like, um, anyway, so I wrote about it, and this is the book that I just published this year called um, Disrupted My Misadventure in the Startup Bubble. And um, what I came to think 
was that, and this is probably not something you want to hear at a, at a conference about startups, which is why I hesitate to say this, but, but that we have positioned this world of Silicon Valley as making all these big steps forward, not just in terms of the technology that gets invented, you can sort of leave that aside for a second, but in terms of work, how we work, how we form companies. We've often described this as the future and as a good thing. I came to think that in many ways Silicon Valley is dragging us backwards and actually making things worse. And those are the things I want to talk about today, which doesn't make for a very uplifting talk because it's like, this sucks, this sucks. Anyway, but bear with me. And I hope you'll keep it in mind as you go off and start your own companies. If some of you, I think, are, are starting companies or already have started companies, um, I, I've broken it down into a set of myths about working in startups that were the myths that I clung to and that were shattered in my own mind. Um, the other reason I wrote the book was not just to make fun of a startup or all startups, but because there's now a trend in the United States where I guess you would call them legacy companies, older companies, are now trying to copy Silicon Valley. They're looking to Silicon Valley as inspiration and innovation, not just, again, in products, but in how products are made, how innovation takes place. So they're, they're, you have companies like Walmart and GE setting up incubators in Silicon Valley and renting space and, you know, putting in the beanbag chairs and the foosball tables and trying to have, like, hey, we're hip, you know, and they want to hire millennials, and the only way you can hire millennials is to give them free beer and, and beanbag chairs, right? There was the one bad thing about the place I worked is they had literally had conference rooms with beanbag chairs, and I was like, where are the fucking chairs, right? And they were like, no, you sit on a beanbag chair. And I'm like, dude, I, I can get into the beanbag chair, but getting out of the beanbag chair is going to be difficult for me. And... The New York Times did a review of my book, and they, the, the artwork was perfect. It's like an old guy in a suit stuck in a beanbag chair like this, right? And I was like, that was so perfect. Um, anyway, so big companies are now going to the valley and trying to copy it, which I find to be a very dangerous thing. And I think um, they're copying sometimes things that aren't good. And we're sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We want the energy and the excitement and the innovation of Silicon Valley, but we're, and we're getting some of that, but we're also getting some of the, the, the worst aspects of Silicon Valley. Um, anyway, not to belabor it, myth, myth number one is you'll get rich. I think that's the big one that gets sold to everybody, is you're going to get rich. You're going to start a startup, and you're going to be Bill Gates or Sergey Brin, right? Um, but... First, keep in mind that most startups fail, right? Almost all of them fail. And then there are different definitions of failing. Sometimes you fail because you utterly just, like, the thing just dies. But there's other failure where you sold and you got acquired and you got acquired for 1.5x what the last in value of your last round, or you, you get acquired on a down round. All those are so forms of failure. Unless it's a 10x return, it's basically seen as a failure, right? And it also means that unless you're the founders, you're not going to make any money. Even in the successes, right, the game has been rigged, especially in the last 10 years, that, such that the venture capitalists get rich, but they're already rich, but they get richer, right? The founders might get rich, but everybody else kind of gets left high and dry. Um, there's a story happening now when a unicorn startup stumbles, its employees get hurt, right? So this happened at Square. Square went public, but it went public at a valuation below its last private round. And so a lot of employees at Square were underwater with their options. They had options, but they were worthless. Jack Dorsey, on the other hand, plenty of money. He did well, right? And a year ago, last summer, I met, or I talked with the CEO in Silicon Valley who predicted this. And this is where it really gets dark, is that this, this person's a CEO of a tech company and does some angel investing and said to me, okay, I was talking about unicorn valuations, because, you know, we still call them unicorns, but in Silicon Valley, they're not very rare anymore. They're now something like 230 unicorns. There were eight a couple years ago. And there's this b ballooning of valuations. And I said to her, what's going on with that? 
who's going to get hurt? Someone has to get left holding the bag when this happens. And this, this woman said to me, here's what happens. Who do you think gets hurt? And I said, I don't know, the, the VCs, because they paid too much. Oh, no. The VCs are protected with something called ratchets. So if a VC comes to you and says, we want to invest in your company, we'll value it at $5 billion. Cool, right? It was worth only $1 billion six months ago, but fine. But we want ratchets. If you go public below $5 billion, you have to give us more shares to make us whole. In fact, in the case of Square, the VCs were protected with ratchets that guaranteed them a 20% return. So they essentially could not lose. The investors could not lose. Unless the company totally failed, they were going to get issued enough shares to make them whole. So they're fine. And I said, oh, well, then the founders. Founders get hurt. No, the founders don't get hurt because what they're doing is saying, you're crazy enough to pay $5 billion for my company? I'd like to sell you some of my personal shares in this round. So they're cashing out before the IPO. Right? The founders are selling their shares in the private rounds and walking away with money. In one case, at a company called Secret, these guys raised some money, and then they didn't need any more money, but they went out and they could raise money, so they raised another $25 million, and they each took $6 million, and one bought a Ferrari, and then six months later they said, this isn't working out, we're just going to shut the company down, right? But they keep the money. Well, they may have given it back. But um, anyway, so, the, so the, this CEO said to me, so the venture capitalists don't get hurt, the founders don't get hurt, who does that leave? And I was like, uh, I don't know. She's like, the employees, stupid, think about it. The employees, they're getting screwed. Their options are now going to get set at this last private round. We know we're never going to go public at that valuation. And every CEO in the Valley knows this. We all know this. We're screwing our employees. And I was like, you are? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, how do you go into work every day and look these people in the eye? She's like, well, most people out here think that they're really good people. They really think that they're morally very, you know, good people, and they just don't think that they're bad. And I was like, but, but you all know that you're doing this, right? She's like, yeah, we totally know. And then... At the, I sort of tucked that away because it was last summer. And then by about this spring, these things started happening. And every time it happens, I write to her and say, oh, my God, there's another one. She's like, yeah, I told you. Like, they know this train wreck is coming, right? Um, another way employees get screwed is, is in a very simple example. You can go look this up. When Zynga went public in the months leading up to the IPO, Mark Pincus, the founder, just went to a bunch of his employees and said, you know, I know we promised you... 10,000 options, but you know what, you got to give 5,000 back. And they're like, what? You promised me 10,000? It's like, well, either that will fire you and you won't get them anyway. So either give them back or just we'll fire you tomorrow and then you won't get anything. So he basically clawed back equity grants that he had given to his own employees uh, in order to you know, I don't know what, he, he's worth billions anyway. But uh, anyway, just feeling like we gave you too much. So you have to be careful about how you approach this as an employee. Um, the larger impact that this has is that, and I think this is not coincidental, is that the ratio of pay between CEOs and average employees keeps going up and up and up. So this is a chart that shows in 1965 in the US, the average CEO had made 20 times as much as the average employee. Right now it's at 295, but look, look, the chart, look how the chart goes. It kind of creeps up, creeps up. Here's the first dot-com bubble, right? Right here, 383. And you think, okay, that's an anomaly, but after the crash, it'll come back. Well, it kind of did, but it didn't really. And now we're at 300. It sort of came back. And what we've seen in the last 10, 20 years, since the, since the advent of the internet, we've had this thing where the top gets more of the money, right? It, it, where wealth doesn't get distributed as evenly. Microsoft, in contrast, created tens of thousands of millionaires, A, because the company was profitable, and B, because it remained profitable and grew for so long that everybody rose up, right? These companies, like Square, Square doesn't make any profit, right? Twitter doesn't make any profit, right? Well, if you're tr selling shares in a profitless company, the insiders can cash out and can make money, the top people can make money, but long term, the only way the employees make money is if, they, is if the company becomes profitable and sustainable and grows, right? But this is not what we've had. Since Netscape, we've had a model where it's grow fast, lose money, go public, get the fuck out, right? That's the model, right? As cynical as that sounds, that's the model. Um, and 
from a larger societal perspective, look at this chart. This is terrifying. Average income growth during economic expansions. This is in the U.S. But you can see the blue bars were the bottom 90%, and the red bars were the top. And so the first economic expansions, you know, the bottom 90% benefited the most, as you would expect, because that's 90% of the population. Since the advent of the Internet, the poor blues, us, haven't got anything. And in this new one, we're actually down while the Jack Dorseys of the world are up, right? So if you're an employee in a startup, beware. Now, you might think, well, I'm going to be the founder of the startup, so I'll be the guy in the red. That's fine, right? However, I would argue to you that <clears throat> even so, that that's not true. Because what you're ending up doing is creating a society with vast, vast amounts of income inequality that isn't good even for the haves. <clears throat> um, um, myth number two, you'll change the world, right? Uh, you're going to do something big and important and change the world. And, and my argument there is that most startups don't and can't change the world because by their nature they're small, they don't have the resources to really do things like renewable energy or fusion energy or artificial intelligence. So mostly what people bite off and chew with, with startups is fairly small things. The one where I was working, which was actually a pretty successful company, was making email spam, like marketing spam, was marketing automation stuff. Does that change the world? I mean, yes, does it make it, I think it changes it for the worse, but it does change the world. Now you get more spam in your inbox, right? But. Um, a couple big examples I like to use on that are Zynga and Groupon, right? Two massively successful IPOs. But did they change the world? I don't know if Groupon changed the world. Zynga certainly didn't, except that for a while you had all those shitty games in Facebook, and then now you don't, right? Uh, I mean, that, that's how Zynga changed the world. Oh, and Mark Pincus' bank account went from zero to billions, right? That, his world changed, right? Um, myth number three, you will have fun. And this is how... Hub, this is how, hub, well, this is where I work, but this is how startups are sold. Like, yeah, like we're all having fun, right? Like, but, you know, it's like, and there is some of that. Like, this place where I worked had like great parties. They had a big Halloween party, a big Cinco de Mayo party. But what you don't, what they never show you in the thing is this, right? And this is really what, and for a while, I was a bad employee, right? So <clears throat> for a while, to punish me, they put me in the, um, in the telemarketing room, like to make me work in there as a blogger. They're like, oh, I have a new desk for you. And it's like the loudest room in the world. And so imagine about this size, a big cavernous cement room with 100, 150 former lacrosse players who just on headsets all day reading scripts into a phone, cold calling people all around the country selling shit, right? And there's me. I had like sound canceling headphones on and earplugs inside and music playing and I could still hear this one guy all day. Um, and they're on brutal quotas. They're on monthly sales quotas. They have a number to hit. If you, you miss your number, you're gone, right? Um, so what you end up happening is you work in a very stressful environment. Actually, some of these startup jobs are very, very taxing. I had a person in sales say to me, nobody can work at this company for more than a couple of years because it's just brutal. It's just, it's not sustainable. That's what she said, like, that's why nobody here is 40. Look around this room. Everybody here is in their 20s because like, when you're 20, 23, 25, you can do this. And mind you, they were getting paid $18 an hour, which in the U.S. is, you know, decent money. The minimum wage in Massachusetts where I live is $9 an hour. So that's what you get at McDonald's. So you're getting twice what you'd make at McDonald's to sit tethered to a machine which monitors you all day long, keeps track of how many times you went to the bathroom, how many calls you made, how many things you closed, all day long with a boss who tells you if you don't make your number at the end of this month, you're gone, right? McDonald's almost starts to look not bad, right? Because at least you can you know, eat free food. Um, but, and there's this insidious thing called culture fit. And Silicon Valley guys are now big into culture fit and they'll hire saying, we'd like to hire people that we'd like to go have a beer with, right? Which to me is like the stupidest reason to ever hire anyone for anything. It's like, yeah, I'd like to hang out with that guy, right? So what happens is you get this, you know, this group think, you get this dynamic where you hire people that remind you of yourself and you all look the same and think the same and nobody sort of dissents, right? Um, it's kind of the wolves in sheep's clothing. Like you signed up for the parties and you get in and they said, here's your desk, make your calls, asshole. And if you don't, we fire you, right? You have brutal cultures like Amazon, where Jeff Bezos finally at Amazon recently said, you know, we never claim that our approach is the right one, just that it's ours. A brutal book came out a couple years ago about people at Amazon crying at their desks. Like, and not telemarketing people, not warehouse workers at Amazon. These are like the white collar information workers, you know, middle managers 
literally sobbing at their desks or sobbing in meetings. Jeff Bezos making people cry in meetings. Like these are very high stress environments, uh, some of these places. Another big problem is diversity. So culture fit, that thing, what it leads to is VCs invest in young white males. Young white males go out and hire other young white males, right? So I looked around the place where I was working, there was no one my age. There was one guy older than me. And we started hanging out, but then we decided we better not because we were getting coupled. We were getting paired as the two old guys, right? So, <clears throat> but every year, and it's not just age diversity. Age diversity is a huge problem in Silicon Valley right now. People age out at 40. 40 is considered old. 50 is like you're a giant redwood tree. You're like, you know, you're, like you're, you're ancient, right? Um, but it goes hand in hand with race diversity problems and gender diversity problems. So every year, Google, Facebook, and Apple put out this report now about their diversity, which is great. They get a big, they pat themselves on the back for like, we put out our report. But every year, the report says we didn't do anything, right? Um, the place where I worked, I looked around, there were no black people. Um, a lot of women, but the women only go so high. Top management, no women, right? In fact, this is why I say some, in some ways we're going backwards. In 1999 in the United States, because this all starts with the venture capitalists, and there's probably VCs here, and they might, <clears throat> and the, and the situation might be vastly different here. But in 1999, women represented only 10% of investing partners at U.S. venture firms, right? And studies show that Firms that have at least one woman investor are more likely to invest in, in startups run by women. So if you're a woman with a startup idea, you're more likely to get funded if you're dealing with a firm that isn't just all guys, right? So it was a pretty abysmal 10%. By 2014, however, it's gone down to 6%. It's actually worse. And in Boston, where I live, it's 3%, right? So the VC industry as an industry itself has this incredible diversity problem. And with everything that goes along with that, you know, it's not just that diversity is a good thing because, oh, it's nice and let's let everybody have a chance. It, diversity is important because you bring in people with different backgrounds who have different ideas and you don't all think one way. The problem on the front in Silicon Valley is you had the rise of the programmer, you know, this term, the programmer. And it seems funny at first, you're like, yeah, they're bros and they code and they're like programmers. This is from the HBO show. But what you've also had is this appalling rise of sexual harassment, um, you know, gender bias, like really ugly stuff. And you can do a Google search for companies like Zillow, read the, um, the lawsuits, read the complaints that were filed against Zillow of like the stuff that women in the sales department at Zillow endure, and it will make you cry. I mean, it's horrible. This is not like we're making a big step forward, we're making the world a better place, right? Myth number four is you'll be treated well. This is going to be great, and you're going to have such great management, right? The reality is that Silicon Valley has rolled out a new way of treating people that says we're a team, not a family. So Reid Hoffman at LinkedIn wrote a book about this. Netflix came out with this thing called the Culture Code, where they said, we're not your family, this is a team, which means that when a better player comes along, we're going to replace you. It's like being on a pro soccer team, you know? Except if you're a pro soccer player, you make millions of dollars a year, you know you could get cut or traded. That's kind of comes with the deal. If you're a telemarketer, it's kind of not fair to apply the same standards to you, right? But <clears throat> we're a team, not a family is, is a big thing in Silicon Valley now, which I think is in stark contrast to the old way of working when I entered the workforce in the 20th century, which was that you had some kind of job security, job training, you would advance inside a company. Jobs in, the, in startups, especially in the US, have become very transactional. We're gonna hire you, you come work for us for 18 months, then get out, right? At our place, they called it graduation. They didn't want to say they fired you, so they said, so-and-so graduated. Isn't that great? He's graduating. Happy. Hey, we're all happy for him. And like, the guy would be gone. You're just looking like, dude, there's an empty chair. Like, where is he? I don't know, poof, he's up in smoke. Um, and they had another metric called value over replacement player, which comes from professional baseball. <clears throat> in this concept of baseball called Moneyball, where managers try to figure out how much should you pay for a second baseman, right? And are we paying too much for our second baseman? And it turns out statistically, in baseball, it's a very statistical game, you can look at what it would cost you to have the average second baseman. What is the average, just the worst average second baseman cost? And then what are we paying for our second baseman, right? And is our second baseman worth that delta? And if not, pff, get rid of him, go get the average guy. Anyway, it's a way of setting prices. Well, the founder of our company loved baseball and he loved this concept of VORP. So he started applying it to everyone inside the company. You had to have a VORP score. Of course, it's 
managers just pulling it out of their ass, right? I mean, there is no science behind this, right? In my case, I had a negative VORP. I mean, they gave me a two out of five, but reality was, I mean, they were paying me a lot of money and like I was doing work that a child could do. But um, anyway, it's a very cruel metric. And I was, I was kind of stunned to see what I thought was gonna be the most progressive, nurturing, amazing place be actually based on these really cruel concepts. <clears throat> these are the good jobs in tech. The worst ones are Uber in the, share, the sharing economy, which you've heard a lot about. Right? This is really dragging the world backwards. The sharing economy is what Robert Reich, the former US Secretary of Labor, has called the share the scraps economy. So there's been huge uh, lawsuits and, and, and controversy in the States about whether Uber drivers should be considered employees. And I'm not a lawyer, but the argument is, by every definition of labor law, Uber drivers are employees, which means they should have benefits, they should have health insurance, they should have some kind of 401k plan, they should be getting paid, their social security should be being paid into, and it's not, right? Uber, and Uber has fought these lawsuits tooth and nail and settled them for a lot of money. But essentially what the sharing economy companies have come up with, and the venture capitalists behind them have come up with, is an investor's wet dream. It's a company that has no employees, right? Uber is a taxi company, a global taxi company that has no cars and no employees. I mean, there's a handful, of, uh, more than a handful, there's hundreds of employees at headquarters, but essentially it's a business without all the mess and fuss of having to take care of actual human beings who work for you, right? And it's not a step forward, right? This is essentially what's being ushered in as a new form of serfdom, right? You have task rabbits, people who run and do errands now. And again, because it's Silicon Valley, it gets dressed up as this wonderful thing. Like, it's great for you to be an Uber driver. You, you, make, your, you make your own schedule. You're in charge of your life. It's like all the freedoms. Like, no, I want fucking health insurance. I have kids, right? And what happened in 2008 in the United States in the big recession was that the economy collapsed, and a lot of people, especially of my generation, got aged out of jobs. Oh, my mic keeps going. Can't get back into the, into the workplace. And the only alternative is Uber, which is usually, for most people, a much worse job than what they used to have. Um, so that's the end of my little left-wing radical rant. Um, <clears throat> myth number five is that there's nothing you can do about this. And this is where I want to ask you, or, you know, if you do start a company, you don't have to follow this model that's been embraced in Silicon Valley, that's been pushed by Silicon Valley. And you don't need to think that everything that they do in Silicon Valley is great or smart or the way to go, right? It's not. In many ways, what Silicon Valley has become is sort of capitalism, capitalism that benefits a small number of people and screws huge numbers of people and actually makes the society at large worse, right? Um, if you start a company, invest in real com uh, culture and good management. That sounds obvious, except that what is real culture, right? People think it's foosball chairs and uh, foosball tables and beanbag chairs and free beer, right? That's not culture, right? That's superficial. Real culture is how you treat people, what you do, right? So if you have a culture where you give people all this free candy and free beer, but then you treat them like shit and fire them without warning or fire them without explanation, and measure them on VORP, there's a cognitive at that you're telling me one thing, but you're doing something else, right? And it makes people crazy, right? It's not healthy. And, it's, and people realize that's not good culture. That's actually a, a toxic culture. So when I say invest in real culture, I mean invest in people, care about people. When I say invest in good management, that sounds obvious too, except that a new thing in Silicon Valley, and especially in startups, has been to be like, no, we don't have management. Zappos, the shoe retailer that's owned by Amazon, in instituted something last year called the holacracy. They said, we're not going to have managers. We're not going to have bosses. We're going to have little circles of people, and you'll all figure it out. And they said, if you're not buying into this, you can leave. And like 40% of the people left, sorry. I mean, people just walked out because they're like, no, I want to have a boss. My argument is... <clears throat> People do want to have a boss, and they deserve to have a boss, and they deserve to be managed well. One thing that happens in startups is that everybody's so focused on growth, and people are growing so fast of that doesn't know how to manage. Because last week they were the, the intern, now they're the team manager, but nobody gave them any training or taught them how to manage people, and managing people is not something 
you can just do, right? Managing people is something you have to learn how to do. Um, <clears throat> So if you start a company, invest in helping people learn how to manage. And if you don't know how to manage, go get someone to help you learn how to manage and then pass that learning around. I think management is actually way more important than we give it credit for in this sexy world of startups. Um, the other one is embrace diversity. <clears throat> this again sounds stupid, but there's a real reason for it. You know, If you build a company with everybody the same age and they're all in their 20s, right? you're actually First of all, missing out on a huge amount of talent of people who are 40 and above. You're missing out on the ideas of women. You're missing out on ideas that come from places where you aren't. And the thing is, when you're in charge and it's your startup hiring person, I get that it's uncomfortable to hire people who are different than you. It's age. I think they really want me to stop. No, but is it, you know what I mean? It's uncomfortable to hire someone much older than you who's going to work for you. But it's also uncomfortable for that person. But if you get through that and can work on that, I think you end up with a broader range of ideas. You end up with more, unfortunately, you end up with more arguments, but more productivity too, right? Um, oh, don't start a company just to start a company. This is like, again, sounds obvious he's clapping, and I thank you. And, and I talked to a guy last week, a friend of mine, who's had three companies in the US, three successful exits, right? And now he's gone to work as a CTO of a company. And I great big idea right now. Like I don't have anything that I think can really scale. And I don't want to start a company just to start a company. That are started just because some, somebody doesn't want to get a job. So they said, I'll start, I'll have my own thing. He said, his, his idea is that those guys are doomed to fail, right? They're not going to work out. I think, is my battery dying? Maybe put it on this one. Okay. Okay. So, I thought that's really good advice, right? If, if you don't have a big, huge idea, that's okay. What you can do is go work for someone else who has a good company and maybe learn management, maybe learn something, and then go start your company. There's nothing wrong with going and working in a place. You know, if you want to really change the world, working at Google X is probably a better way to change the world than starting a company with three of your friends to make some marketing software, right? I mean, there are places that are changing the world, and you can get into those. And then maybe you can leave and do something out of that. Um, <clears throat> my last point is make a profit and share the wealth. The most amazing thing to me in the last 10 years in Silicon Valley is that there are companies that never turn a profit. They never actually become profitable. They raise venture money, and they can carry on. They can sell to the public markets, and they have money in the bank, but they lose money quarter after quarter after quarter. And in some ways, they're quote unquote successful. But my belief is that you can't really be successful unless you can sell your product or service for more than it costs you to make and deliver it. That that is actually the definition of success for a business, being able to make a profit. And it's not just a good thing to do. It's the only way your company will become sustainable, right? Otherwise, all these companies now are running out of runway. They're running out of cash. The story that's happening in Silicon Valley is unicorns are doing down rounds. They're burning cash. And these things are going to start to collapse unless they can turn a profit. So now, of course, what you have is startups in Silicon Valley trying to redefine what profit means, you know, like coming up with fake bogus metrics for what a profit is so they can claim they're profitable. But, but we all know what a profit is, right? When you subtract all your expenses and you get to the bottom, is there any money left? That's a profit, right? And the reason that's good is that's going to keep you in business. That's going to provide good jobs for your employees. And when I say share the wealth, I say don't be greedy. If you're the founder or the VC, you know, make sure everybody gets a part of this. Make sure everybody gets those people's work are the reason you're succeeding. I think this is the idea of the heroic entrepreneur who did it all himself and the employees just happened to be there, right? And it's like, no, those employees are the ones who made you rich. Right? They're the ones who made this company successful. So hire good people, invest in them, and then reward them. Right? Finally, I would say, you know, this whole idea of changing the world, you don't have to cure cancer or invent artificial intelligence to change the world. I think you can change the world in a smaller way, which is build a company with 10 people or 20 people that turns a profit, that does well, and provide good solid, sustainable employment for 10 people, for 20 people who have families, who have kids. You can make a tiny bit of the world a much better place, right, by doing that. Um, that's the opportunity that you have. And 
I, I wish you good luck as you go ahead and do that. Thank you.